in El Salvador, in many other countries, there have been women who have been recruited by male leaders into the fighting forces. Now, we have a lot more understanding of actually what happens to them when they are pulled into the fighting forces, not just the images, but actually what is their actual experience of being women in insurgent fighting forces. And in fact, one of the reasons I devoted a whole chapter to this newest book, this book called 12 Feminist Lessons of War, is I wanted to really pull out and make featured the lessons that women who have fought in insurgent armed forces, what are their lessons about their experiences? Not just us looking at them and looking at the image of the woman with the rifle and think everything has changed, but actually what's the experience over time of women in Vietnam, in Algeria, in Cuba, who and in Nicaragua, who have fought in fighting forces and that are insurgent and supposedly social progress forces, anti-colonial or anti-racist forces. What have been their actual experiences? And we know a lot more now about those women's experiences, including after the war, when they are demobilized, um, than we did before. And they have given us very strong cautions about imagining that when male leaders draw usually young women into their fighting forces, what actually happens to gender equity? Not just during the insurgency, but afterwards. What actually happens to women's relationships to men? Look at Eritrea also. Sure. Don't just look at one or two. Look at what happened to the girls who were brought into the Tamil Tigers. What happened to the girls? They're almost all girls, late teenagers, into the Eritrean um, independence forces. What happened to the women who were brought into the Sandinistas in Nicaragua against the dictatorship there? What happened to the women who were brought into the Algerian forces against French colonialism. What happened to them? Because what too often I've learned happened is we get excited. Well, some of us get excited. Some people get excited. I'm much more wary these days, to tell you the truth. But some of us get excited when we see women doing unconventional things. And that is the photograph of a woman with a rifle. Mm. But, but in fact, that's not, <laughs> yes, that's not enough of information to tell us whether women going into fighting forces is a guarantee of the dismantling of patriarchy in the long run. So if you, I forget what chapter it is. Just a minute, I'll even tell you. So you, if you only want to read one chapter, this could be the chapter. Wait, here I come back. So this is this is this new book. And and every chapter, to tell you the truth, felt kind of risky. So these lessons are not simple lessons. They're lessons I had to kind of tussle with. So this um, chapter is called Women as Armed Insurgents Offer Feminist Caveats. Caveats means warnings. Women as armed insurgents offer feminist caveats, warnings. And that's chapter five, if you just want to read one chapter. Thank you. Thank you for the shortcut there. Uh, we have uh, Professor Nadim who flags certain issues as being significant in terms of regional identities, historical legacies, and socioeconomic factors. Speaks about in regions with strong military presence or ongoing conflict, the experiences of women and girls may be shaped by heightened security measures, militarized environment, influencing the access to education, employment opportunities, etc. So uh, he's and conversely in areas where military presence is not so much, forms of gender-based violence or patriarchal structures, 
may exert greater influence on women. Do you agree with that? Yes, well, I, I do insofar as that any society that takes collectively, which doesn't mean just who's in power now, but who are the main media influencers, who are the main educators, who are the main drama script writers, and who are the main social movement leaders, what do they think about violence against women and about men who perpetrate violence against women? And my sense is that where, and there aren't enough countries where this is true, but where violence against women, domestic violence, rape, sexual harassment, sexual intimidation, sexual exploitation, trafficking, where that is taken seriously in public and in private, you are much more likely to have a secure society. Put it the other way, in a society that claims that militarized security is what should be prioritized and what happens to women is just their own problem and boys will be boys and so you can't punish male perpetrators for just being what they naturally are in those sorts of societies you have a high level of insecurity no matter what the defense budget is so Chandralok Kumar asks a related question on the notion of natural or need, what is considered natural, and how do you see men as a protector and women as a protected in tribal societies? Well, I think every society, I mean, there are all kinds of indigenous societies and ethnic minority and ethnic majority, religiously based communities, and you have to ask that question. I think it's a great question. But it's a question to ask. It's not that I think tribal societies or American indigenous societies or Latin American indigenous societies are all the same as to how they think about femininity and being protected and masculinity and being protectors. I think you have to ask. You have to ask. You have to explore. And when you explore, you have to really listen hard not only into what are the motivators for playing those sorts of roles, but yeah. also the consequences. And then you have to listen to people in those societies. I'm not going to go into an indigenous society and pretend that I'm the be all and end all of knowledge. Because within those societies, there will be debates they may be very quiet debates, but there will be debates. And that's where I take my clues. Yeah, at some point you did say that feminist questions and not just feminist answers. So that's Absolutely. significant. We need to have those questions. We have one here from Niharika, Niharika Saikia, who says, what role do you think resentment plays when understanding exclusion of women from certain areas? And when you talk about militarize, militarization begins at home along the lines of protector, how do you think we can analyze family as a militarized institution if such resent, resentment exists? <laughs> uh, well, I think families are very interesting to be our kind of practice stages. I think for all of us, and you don't have to tell, it can be for your own knowledge. You don't have to go public with what you found out about your family. But I think if any of us really practice gender feminist exploration in our families over a couple of generations and within a couple of circles, not just the nuclear family, um, I think we could learn a lot about feminist gender analysis and, and who really in the family is most inclined to adopt these ideas about protector and protected, about the world being a dangerous place, about us and them, about it being natural to be enemies, about soldiers being the most respected of citizens, 
who holds those ideas and passes them on and who rejects them and what do the resistances sound like inside the family and i think that would be fascinating fascinating i was on a zoom yesterday just yesterday and on the zoom were young women from oh gosh i think 12 different countries and we were talking about the arms industry and i was saying i really want and this by the way i still i want it in india too i want feminist gender analysis of just one armaments factory. We have almost no gender analysis of any armaments factory. I don't even mean one of the biggest companies. I mean, maybe a small company that just makes night goggles, which are highly militarized. Anyway, that was, that was the discussion. And this young woman said, you know, I'm from the former East Germany. And now that you're asking these questions, I began thinking, this is about families. I began thinking about my uncle and said my uncle was able, when the Soviet Union still dominated Eastern Europe, my uncle was able to get out of Eastern Europe to Western Europe because he had a set of engineering skills and he was hired by a defense contractor, a weapons maker in Western Germany. And for him, it was liberation. And working in that weapons factory as an engineer, he and within our family story, that was his route to success and to freedom. And she said, I'm now thinking about how our family thinks about that. Right. And it was very interesting to watch her start thinking about that family story of the uncle getting freedom before the collapse of the Soviet Union because he accepted a job in a weapons factory. And she said, I really I'm going to talk about that with other members of my family now, my, what we think about that. So families are very complicated and they're fluid. You know, not everybody stays the same. And we don't and choose it. We're born no. in it. <laughs> no, that's right. And, and if you're a, a new choice there. Way, you're born into it. And um, but what do you do with it? And what's the storyline? Um, and does it change? So I think practicing just for your own sake. You don't have to tell anybody. Just for trying to keep a notebook for yourself and try and figure out what are the complicated gender relationships inside your family and to what extent any of them feed militarization would be so interesting again you don't have to tell anybody although we're all interested but you don't have to tell you can become a novelist and write it as a novel <laughs> So we have something uh, which our own from our center, Dr. Adfar Shah, uh, speaks about the military industrial complex and that it's here to stay. It's going to be there for whatever reasons within the capitalist ethos and for the political economy of, you know, survival. So in for established reasons of security, for nationalism, for might, pride, whatever that we are speaking about, uh, the question is how can women Organize, women's organizations and global feminist movements counter to demilitarize women's lives? Uh, well, there are, you're right. In a lot of our countries, weapons makers, and a lot of them are high tech makers, so they don't look as though they're making a rifle or a tank. They're making technology that is, serves um, armaments purposes. Um, and those are usually local factories and whole communities can come to depend on those local factories and that can militarize an entire town even if only a fourth of the employed people in town work in that factory it can feel like the whole town is dependent on getting the next defense contract of they can even become dependent on a narrative that the world is a dangerous place because the world is a dangerous place is a storyline that helps their local factory get the next contract. You know, those but things just are related. The, just the employment it's generating, it's it's a bit like economy ecology debate. 
And oh, absolutely. To sustain one, you have to, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a give and take there. Yes, so, and you can even find members of parliament and here members of Congress who aren't particularly militaristic. They're not particularly warmongering. I mean, sometimes they are. But they're not necessarily. They are for their constituents getting jobs. And so defense, the defense industry and the military industrial complex, but it's the complex is their interdependence. That's why it's called a complex. Right. Um, and the complex is fed by the desire for jobs. For jobs. So one of the things that a lot of women's groups do is try to imagine those companies with those skills and that infrastructure and that capital producing something more socially useful, better train carriages, better hospital equipment, better housing construction materials. All of those things could be more socially useful than building tanks or even high-tech technology. And that a lot of women's groups in many countries um, are trying to think about what's a more socially useful thing that can still sustain jobs, can still make a reasonable profit for the stockholders and yet be more socially useful. But here's the thing that we all know, and that is that jobs is such an election campaign pledge. And if, if, if one doesn't think about militarism, and just thinks about the making of fighter planes as a job, it's much easier to militarize a whole town. And it's much easier to militarize a marriage that is within any armaments factory. You'll find women in very particular parts of most armaments factory. The highest concentration of women in an armaments factory or defense contract factory is in the wiring department. It's just like garment industries. The notion of femininity as dexterity with fingers and, and patience and ability to concentrate. Those are considered highly feminized attributes. Now, you know, I'm not very good with doing delicate work, so I'm not a good match for that, but it is a stereotype. And so you do have women in weapons factories, but you particularly find them, not only, but you particularly find them in the clerical worker, because every defense contractor is dependent on clerical workers. And you don't think of them as making weapons, but they are keeping the weaponry system working and in the wiring department. But there are also women who are not working in the defense contractor locally, but who are married to somebody who is. And they feel as if their whole family's economic security is dependent on their husband having a well-paying, decently paying job in a weapons manufacturer. And that means she becomes nervous if that, if her husband's employer isn't in line to get the next defense contract. It doesn't mean that she spends a lot of her time thinking about foreign policy. She probably hasn't thought about who's going to be harmed by which of these weapons. She doesn't even think of herself as somebody who wants anyone to be harmed. But she really does want her family to have economic security. And that's how militarization works. It doesn't just come through the front door. It comes through the side doors and under the floorboards. And you can militarize a marriage insofar as the whole family feels as though they're dependent on the husband in the family keeping his weapons contract job. So that's why I really want, see, I'm greedy. So, you know, I'm, I'm really a greedy kind of 
academic. And I want to know more. I want to know. I want to study. Honestly, we don't have one. We do not have a study of a single town that's dependent for the economic well-being of the town on a defense contractor. We don't know what the gender dynamics and the power dynamics are in that town, which means we really don't know how the military industrial complex works because almost nobody ever does a gender analysis of a military industrial complex. Unless you count the fact that we have a defense minister who's a woman in India <laughs> and, you know, which which is pitted as breaking stereotypes that the finance minister is a woman and the defense minister is one. Well, I mean, it's not nothing, but it just means you can militarize anybody. And it also means that those women who want to break the glass ceilings, the stereotypical gender glass ceilings, have to prove their masculinized knowledge. Would they call it masculinized knowledge? <laughs> well, it's mas it masculinized knowledge is a narrow knowledge. So is feminized knowledge. You know, I can take one more question and then I oh, very quickly we have Dr. Uh, Fidos from our center says how far uh, does militarization discourse around femininity and masculinity, uh, how far can it be compared with militarization of the dominant race in the Middle East? Oh, well, I think you can militarize races and it, it's not really clear whether you're talking about whether one is talking about Arabs as a race, Persians as a race, Kurded Kurds as a race, Jews as a race. I mean, there are Bedouins as a race. I mean, race is a really, really tricky question, and it should be. I mean, it really should be. So I don't tend to use those terms um, because the Middle East is so racially complex and so diverse and so interwoven. Um, but I do think this is what intersectional gender feminist analysis means. It means that you really think seriously. I'm going to take it much more specifically now. You really think seriously about what it has meant in the last 20 years, maybe 40 years, to be a Gazan Palestinian women's rights activist. What has it really meant? And Almost none of the news coverage, all kinds of news coverage, almost no news coverage that I've seen. Now, if, if I've missed it and you've seen it, please pass it on to me. OK, even if it's in Arabic or in Hebrew or in Persian, um, pass it on to me so that I'll get smarter somehow. But I have not seen a single serious interview analysis and historical account of Gazan feminist movement. And that means that we really don't know what intersectional gender feminist analysis of tensions in the Middle East are like. I think it's come in the form of a lot of stand up and a lot of poetry which is uh, yes. progressive poetry, but perhaps not in the media in that sense of the term, but there's a lot of outpourings, a lot of ventilation, and I think that projects quite a bit. Yeah. Yes, oh no, feminism is always in a literature study. Yes. Uh, Zulfikar exactly. has asked a null and void question because he's saying that the perspective we are discussing is Western in nature, is it? But I think she's kind of... Um, uh, that's not correct. And then we have um, specifically Tanmoy, who's now put his uh, 
I think 50,000 words into some hundred words <laughs> is saying that specifically related to the narratives of masculine security state while extracting resources from frontier areas, uh, for example, um, uh, the northeast of India that we speak sure. about most of which which is tribal land and also the counter movements which is insurgency which again appropriate motherland ideas that notion so how do women travel in this kind of a tapestry that is there especially well, all this the visible time, intersectionality I mean, of identities absolutely i mean to understand the tribal um communities experience of being intruded upon and controlled by state-supported extractive industries requires an intersectional curiosity about how women in tribal communities think about security, think about strategies for increasing genuine security. And then you have to listen, right? But you do have, all of us, but you do have to listen being ready to be surprised and being ready to hear aspirations that you're finding unexpected. But that's what that's why intersectional feminist analysis is the best. Always, always. You always ask, what does it mean to be a poor woman? What does it mean to be a poor man? What does it mean to be a minority ethnic or racial person in a multiracial society. What does it mean in fact? And it means that this is why I think that since I, I mean, I used to do ethnic politics. That's why I studied Malaysia. So I thought I was, oh, you know, I thought I was very observant. But in fact, I never really looked at the men and the women in the Malay, the Indian and the Chinese communities in Malaysia until I became a feminist. And I think when you become a intersectionally curious gender feminist analyst, you're just much more attentive to the complexities and the dynamics. And that makes feminists are never cartoon makers. They're always complicators, <laughs> right? So thank you so much for thank you, thank you. Uh, a formal vote of thanks, but.